Hello and welcome to Unity Presbyterian Church Online. This week in worship, Pastor David begins a series on experiencing God with a look at the difference between knowing something and experiencing it. Let's listen. Well, we are beginning a brand new series today. We've uh, finished our summer series on relationships and we are beginning a seven-week series on experiencing the presence of God. And the focus of this series will be just that, experiencing God on a daily basis, on a moment-by-moment basis. The focus statement to get you thinking about where we're headed for this series uh, will be on your screens in just a second. It's this. Thinking about something is not the same thing as experiencing something. Okay, let me give you an example. I can think all I want about traveling to Africa and going on an African safari. I can imagine what it would be like to fly over there and and to, to drive around and see the wild animals, and I can think about what that would make me feel if I were to do that. I can think about that all day, but experiencing that would be completely different. I mean, to actually buy that plane ticket and go on the long, many, many hour flight over there, uh, to, to actually be in the African safari and hear and smell and experience with my senses all that that entailed, and then to actually see a lion with my eyes, the experience of it would be so different than me simply thinking about it. Let me give you another example. I could become an expert on skydiving by thinking about skydiving and by studying and researching skydiving. I I could get books on it from the library and read about what it would feel like to jump out of a plane and have all the the wind rushing back me, past me. I could be the resident expert on skydiving. But that would be so different than experiencing it myself and feeling it in my body as I jumped out of a plane and felt the wind rushing past me. And and I I just got to pause for a second and and say, if you really want to talk to someone who has experienced this before, we need to give a major shout out to Unity member Barbara Winkles. This is her jumping out of a plane. I can't believe you did that, Barbara. You are amazing. Yeah, you did this skydiving with your granddaughter, which I think is just so, so cool. So if you want someone to talk to about what it actually felt like to skydive, go talk to Barbara. That is amazing. The, the point, though, is, is this. Thinking about something and experiencing something, those are two different things. And this applies directly to our understanding of God as well. Thinking about God is not the same thing as experiencing God. For many of us, our journey of faith began more intellectually. We thought about God, and we thought about what we believe about God. You've had these uh, probably uh, thoughts before, these questions before, where you go, well, what do I think about the character of God? What do I think about how God created the world? Uh, What do I think about God being a loving God or how God created the Bible? And, you know, we have all of these belief sort of questions where we think about God. And for many of us, that's a big portion of our faith. What do we think about God? But do you see what all those questions have in common? They're thinking about God, and the danger in that is that you make God almost this abstract object that you're thinking about, but not necessarily experiencing. Now, we need to think about God. God gave us minds, and God wants us to use them, and so we should be deeply thinking and contemplating about the nature of God, but the premise of this series is that thinking about God, the intellectual knowledge about God, is only half of our way of knowing God. And the other half is actually experiencing God, experiencing the love of God, experiencing the grace of God, experiencing union 
with God. Yes, the intellectual knowing and the experiential knowing must go hand in hand in a person's faith development. In the Western world that we find ourselves in today, I believe that the intellectual way of knowing and thinking about God is much, much more common. In this series, we're going to reclaim a little bit about what it means to experience God on a moment-by-moment basis. To begin that exploration, we're going to begin with a story from the book of Exodus. It's a story about the people of God. And the people of God have been in Mount Sinai. They've been camped out around Mount Sinai, and they've been learning about God. Uh, Moses has given them the Ten Commandments and has been teaching them about God and really forming the people into the people of God. And they're about to depart on a journey where they're going to leave Mount Sinai now that they really know who God is, and they're going to go to the Promised Land a land that God has reserved for them uh, to to create their own civilization, to create their own place where they can build houses and really have roots. There's only one problem. The last time that Moses went up on the mountain to talk with God, the people of God got a little bit bored, and they decided to create their own God in place of God. Yes, they created an idol. They made a golden statue of a calf. Personally, if I was creating my own God, I don't think that would be the the God I would create. I I don't think I would pick a a golden statue of a cow, but but they did. Uh, They created a golden calf and decided to worship that calf. Well, Moses came down the mountain, and obviously he was furious. He was upset with his people so quickly going astray, and God was equally upset with his people. Well, they repented, and so it's all good now, right? Well, not completely. You see, now they are about to head off into this journey. And God tells the people that you're going to go on this journey to the promised land. But, and here's how we pick up the story in Exodus 33, verse 3. But I will not go with you, because you are a stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. Yes, God is upset with his people right now, and he's sharing how upset he is with them because of their disobedience of creating this this idol, this God in place of God. He's saying, listen, I'm not going to go with you on this journey. You don't want me to go with you on this journey because I'm so mad at you. I might destroy you if I went with you on this journey. God kind of reminds me of a really angry or upset parent who is with his teenager And says, okay, fine, I will drive you to your friend's house, but you will not say a word during that car ride. And if you do, I'm going to stop the car and make you walk the rest of the way. That's how upset I am right now. Doesn't God kind of remind you uh, of, of being a parent that's so upset with his people? So God says, I will not be going with you on your journey to the promised land. As I was studying this this week, I wonder if you had a similar reaction to me, where I just uh, asked myself, well, how is that possible? I mean, God is everywhere, right? And so how can God's presence not go with them on this journey to the promised land? Logically, how is that possible? But as I thought more about it and studied more about it, I realized there's really two ways of understanding God's presence. The first is God's general presence. God is everywhere. God's here right now. God is with you right now. God's presence encompasses the whole earth, the whole world, all of God's creation. You and I cannot take a breath without relying on God to do so. And so there is God's general presence. But the other way to understand it is there's also God's specific revealed presence. There are times where you become acutely aware of God's presence in your life, where you feel God in in a a moment of, of intense union with God. You realize God is here right now. And yes, God was always there, right? God's presence is always there, but for a moment, you experience it. You realize it. 
You see, up until this point, the people of God had been understanding God's presence as the specific revealed presence of God. They, they knew God was there with them. And God is saying, when you go on this journey, you are no longer going to experience my presence in that way. The specific revealed presence of God that you are so used to will not be going with you. So God will still be present, but not in the way that they are used to understanding or experiencing God. Moses, uh, upon hearing this, decides to have a conversation with God. And I want you to notice in this conversation how often Moses puts the, the onus on God to take responsibility for his people. Uh, particularly, look at how many times Moses says, you, right? You, God, did this. You, God, want this. We'll pick up our story again in verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. Moses makes it abundantly clear to God that, that he does not want to go on this journey without God. He needs God, and he needs God to take responsibility for his people. Right? He's saying, God, they're not my people. You initiated this. You asked me, you told me to lead them, but they're your people. So God, I need you to come with us if we are going to do this journey. If God is truly sending Moses, Moses needs to know that God is going with him. Now, I wonder, have you ever had a similar experience before where you felt in your life that God wanted you to to take out a step outside your comfort zone, to do something that was going to be hard for you, whether that was in parenting or whether that was in your marriage or whether that was in your job, you felt like God placed on your heart something that was going to be challenging. And perhaps you said to God, okay, God, I will do this, but I need some assurance that you're going to go with me in this. God, if I'm going to take a leap of faith, I need the confidence that you're going to leap right there with me that you're going to catch me as I jump. That's a bit what Moses is saying here. Okay, God, if I'm going to lead your people, God, please assure me that you're going to be leading there right them, right beside me, right there with me. Here's how God responds in verse 14. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Yes, God says, okay, okay, I will go with you, Moses. You will experience the specific revealed presence of God as you journey. And there's a link that I want to draw to your attention, where God's presence, being there with Moses, leads directly to Moses being in a state of rest. Yes, God's presence leads to rest for your soul which means that when you are about to engage in something new, something hard, something unsettling, how do you normally feel beforehand? I mean, do you wake up in the middle of the night thinking about it? Does it occupy a lot of brain space going, how am I going to possibly do this thing? Do you find yourself when you wake up in the morning that that's the first thing you think about, and that as you go throughout your day, your, your thoughts are consumed with, with worry or, or with anxiety. Yeah, when we're about to do something really hard, often those are the feelings that are consuming our mind and our body. But wouldn't it be great to replace all of those feelings with the experience of rest, where your heart, your soul, your mind were fully at rest, and you had the confidence that God's presence was going to be in you and around you as you then engaged in this new challenging endeavor. Moses, he's terrified right now of leading these stubborn, stiff-necked people on this journey to the promised land. 
And it is clear that he needs to experience God with him because in that experience, he will be at rest. And when you have that restful, non-anxious presence, you can lead in the best way possible. What sort of words would you use to describe your heart or your soul when you're in that experience of rest? Would you say that you are overwhelmingly calm or that your heart feels at peace? Uh, Would you say that your life feels balanced in that moment? Yes, God's presence is linked to a soul that is at rest. When I was writing this sermon this week, I was thinking specifically of our parents, of our students, and of our teachers and administrators, because they are beginning a really, really challenging journey. As I said earlier, this school year is going to be unlike any other, where parents right now are having to grapple with what is the safe and what is the right thing for me to do with my children and and the way that my children are educated this year. And they're also having to grapple with, and what is possible? What's possible for me to do if I'm balancing a job and I'm balancing my finances and balancing my kids with virtual learning or in-person learning? There's going to be a lot of challenges this next year. And the same is true for our school teachers and administrators. You're looking at this school year and saying, how do we provide a safe environment that's also maximized to help our kids learn and and become educated, this is going to be a very, very challenging year. And so I was thinking about you as I was writing this sermon, and know that I will be praying that you will experience God's presence with you as you go into this new journey, as you go into this new school year. And I hope all the feelings of fear and anxiety and stress can be replaced by a feeling of rest that can only come when you are feeling God's presence within you. Yeah, this year is not going to be easy, but I know that God will go with you into this new journey. Well, God promises Moses, okay, I will go with you. My presence will go with you. You will experience rest. That's really good news, but Moses wants to double check that this is actually going to happen. So the next verse says this, then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. I.e., I don't even want to start this journey if you are not going to be coming with us. So how will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. Yes, the most important thing for Moses as he begins this new challenging journey is the assurance of God's presence. And really, that's the most important thing for us as well. With whatever you are facing in this next week or this next month, the assurance of God's presence will be the most important thing. This is a good time to remind you that God is always present. God will be present with whatever you are going through. But as Christians, we, like Moses, need to also pursue God's presence so that we can experience it. It's not enough to intellectually know or believe that, yes, God is present here right now. The next step is to pursue that presence. Because in pursuit of that presence is where the feeling of rest will come from. Then, after this reassurance from God that God will go on the journey with Moses, Moses then makes a very strange and bold request. In verse 18, then Moses said, Now show me your glory. Okay, that's a very different request, isn't it? Up until this time, Moses has just said, please come with us. Maybe i be assured of your presence. I, I want to know that you are journeying with us. But now, now Moses asks something different. Moses says, God, show me your glory. The word glory in Hebrew is very similar to the words presence and face. So it is 
It is as if Moses is saying, God, I want to see your presence. It's not enough for me to experience you or to be assured that you are coming with us. I, with my eyes, with my senses, God, I want to see you. I want to see your glory. It is as if Moses is saying, I want to see the face of God. Now, that's a really, really unique question, isn't it? Or, or a request for Moses to have, to say, I want to see the face of God. So let's dig into that a little bit to find out what it really is that Moses is asking for here. So up until this time, uh, the, the primary way that Moses met with God was that Moses would go to a place called the Tent of Meeting. Uh, we've got a picture of what that may have looked like. It's basically a, a giant tent, because remember, around Mount Sinai, the people of God were living in tents. This was not a permanent residence for them. They didn't have a homeland yet. They were a nomadic people living in tents. But one tent was reserved. That was the Tent of Meeting. When Moses wanted to experience God, or go to God for guidance, Moses would enter the tent of meeting. And then we read that a cloud would come and surround that tent, and that cloud would be a visible representation of the presence of God. Moses, when he was in that tent of meeting, would experience God, but he would not see God. Right? He would just see the cloud, so now, Moses is asking for that, that next step of understanding. Saying, God, it's not enough for me to just experience you or feel you. God, I want to see you. How do you think God will respond to that, that request from Moses? Here's what God says. In verse 19, And the Lord said, I will cause all of my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. So God is responding to Moses and basically saying to Moses, I can't honor that request. I can't allow you to see my face. But instead, God offers to show Moses something different. Did you catch this in verse 33, or chapter 33, verse 19, when God said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. Yes, God is telling Moses, it's less important for you to see some sort of my physical characteristics and more important for you to see something of my character. I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you. I will cause something of my character, my essence, who I am, to come and pass in front of you. There have been times that I, like Moses, have longed to see the face of God. I mean, how much easier would life be, right, if you could see God face to face? There have been times where I've prayed, God, just, just show me. Show me who you are, because then, then I can believe fully, right? Then, then, God, I will do whatever you ask of me if I can simply see you. But God is responding by saying that's not actually the right request to make. But instead, maybe we should be saying, God, show me something of your character. God, in this life, show me your goodness. Show me who you are. And if I look back on my life and think about the times that I've seen the goodness of God, when I've seen the character of God in tangible and visible ways in my life, then I can say with assurance that I have seen God. Surely you can think of times as well where you have seen God's goodness, where you have experienced God's grace that you may not have seen God visibly with your eyes, but you have seen the goodness of God in other people. Just like Bailey was saying, we don't see the wind, but you see the effects of the wind. We, we see the effects of God's character 
in this world, even without seeing the physical manifestation of that character. Moses, it turns out, is going to see the goodness of God, but, but also, in, this, in honoring this request, God is, is re- making it clear that Moses does not even realize what it is he's asking for. Because to see the face of God would result in Moses' death. You saw in verse 20, God said, but you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Yes, there's a gap between the infinite and the finite. And in our current state in humanity, we are we're incapable of seeing the face of God. That experience will be reserved for the life after this life. Yes, the life everlasting. But in the here and now, God offers Moses something different. He goes on in verse 21. Then the Lord said, There is a place near where you may stand on a rock, and when my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. A a cleft in a rock is is like a crack or a crevice in a rock. So what God is telling Moses is that his presence, his glory, will pass by. But but when he does so, God's going to take Moses and put him in this this crack of a rock. There's a a picture that I want to show you Um, of an artist's rendition of what this may have been like for Moses. And and what I love is Moses is almost hiding in the crack of this rock, and then surrounding him is the glory and the presence of God that you can almost tell by looking at that photo that that glory would have overwhelmed Moses if he were to see it face to face. I thought that was an excellent rendition of what that experience may have been like. Yeah, Moses, to request to see God, didn't really understand what he was asking. And so in response to that, God offers Moses protection to say, I'm, I'm going to put you in, in this crevice within the rock, and then I'm going to pass by, and you are simply going to get a glimpse of me. You can't handle seeing me face to face, but instead you're, you're going to get a, a glimpse. You're just going to see the back of God as God's glory passes by. I was at a a conference once, and there was a renowned Old Testament Bible scholar there. He was the the keynote uh, speaker. His name was Walter Brueggemann. Uh, He was 83 years old uh, a couple years ago when I was at this conference, and he was preaching on this text, this exact text that we are studying today. I just, I've read so much of what he has written, and his commentaries have been really helpful and meaningful in my own study and personal development, so I was so excited to go and and see him. And and then I was even more excited when I got invited by some of my former professors to go and grab a beer with Walter Brueggemann later that week. I I thought, this is amazing. What, What a fun celebrity experience that I get to have here. And so I I went to the restaurant, and Walter was outside the restaurant, so I got to to talk with him before the the rest of the group got there. And I really, I kind of wanted to ask him to take a picture with me, because I thought if I could take a picture with him, I could send it to Sarah and say, look, how neat is this? This is Walter Brueggemann. And she would text back, who? What, What is this? I mean, most people get very excited when they see a celebrity, and they want to take a picture of the celebrity. Pastors get really excited when they see Bible commentators. I know, we're we're really lame, but that's just who we are. And so I really wanted to ask Walter, hey, let's take a selfie together. But the rest of the group came and uh, and ushered us very quickly into the, the restaurant, and so I missed my opportunity. And I was so thankful that I missed my opportunity. Because as we sat down to dinner, Walter began complaining about what he called the selfie generation. And he was saying, oh, all these, 
these young people want to come up to me and take pictures with me and take selfies with me. And, and he said, the, the next person who comes up to me and, and asks to take my picture, I'll say, sure, that's fine. And then, and then he said, and then I'll turn around and show him my backside, just like God did with Moses. And I thought to myself, I'm so glad I did not ask him to take a selfie. That would have been so embarrassing. But it got me thinking that this is really an unusual ending to our text today, isn't it? That Moses is simply going to see the back of God as God's presence goes by. What are we to make of that? Well, really, the conclusion I've come to is that I believe God is trying to reveal in this story that here on earth, in our earthly existence, we are going to have indirect knowledge of God. We will never know God face to face in this existence. No, we'll get to know of God, but everything we know of God and think of God will be almost seeing God from the back, this kind of indirect knowledge. But even in the midst of that, we can still humbly experience God's presence. I mean, Moses was still in the crack of the rock. And within the cleft of the rock, Moses experienced as much of God's presence as he could handle. So we too, even though we are in this experience understanding God in an indirect way, and we'll never fully see God face to face, we can still experience about as much of God as we can possibly handle. As we are beginning this series and exploring how, what practical ways can we experience God's presence, I want to give you one challenge as you go throughout your week. The challenge is this. Every time that you catch yourself thinking about God, pause for a moment and then turn that into a prayer to God. You see, the, the hope here is that we take a, a pause from our intellectual understanding of God and, and always thinking about God, and instead begin talking to God face to face. Begin seeking to experience God's presence. And so that is your challenge. So the next time you're thinking about God, just pause and turn that into a prayer to God. If you would like more information about Unity Presbyterian Church, please visit our website at www.unitypres.org or visit us on Facebook. This is the Unity Presbyterian Church Podcast. Have a great week.